For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. This episode was made possible in part by the generous support of the Tyndale House Foundation. For more information, visit tyndale.foundation. The story society tells about what it is to be normal, to be productive, a contributing member of society, are really bound to ideas of intellectual capacity physical capacity, and in the Christian tradition especially, a capacity to serve and care for others. When that seems to be removed, or the notion that in one's life, those possibilities could be stripped away from who I am, that's terrifying. The stories that we tell about about normalcy and disability are bound to how we think of ourselves as humans and what it means to flourish. And those same stories invite fear when we even subconsciously or implicitly consider that the loss of memory, a loss of intellectual capacity could be a real lived possibility for one's own life. This is For the Life of the World, a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. Callie, for the last 30 minutes, you've observed me have what you, I think, very helpfully called a disabling experience, setting up a microphone. That's right. You watched so patiently while I attempted to put a mic in one place and then another and then encountered the sort of um, uh, incorrigible is the word. Yeah. <laughs> An absolutely incorrigible mic stand that just would not let me do what I wanted to do. Evan, there were all sorts of material obstacles in your way to getting this <laughs> podcast going. I watched you struggle trying different possibilities, creative possibilities. Yeah. The chair, the stand, the desk, yeah. and not trying to navigate the space in a way that just was not working for your body and what you wanted to accomplish <laughs> in this moment. It was a it was a disabling experience. It was frustrating. Um, but we also laughed and there was yes. joy in that in this in the material struggle. Yeah. We dropped you straight into the middle of that conversation because I wanted to share a little bit of the disorienting, frustrating experience I had when I invited Callie McCauley over to the Yale Center for Faith and Culture office to talk about disability. Yeah, so my name is Callie McCauley. I study disability and religion. You can find my publications in the Journal of Disability and Religion and soon to be the Disability Studies Quarterly. Callie recently finished her PhD at Yale and will soon be an ordained minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. No doubt this 30-minute battle with a microphone was relatively brief, and I don't at all want to make light of the fact that my norm is not disability. Occasional low back pain and skateboarding injuries notwithstanding, Physically and intellectually, navigating the world usually comes without the frustration and stress and embarrassment of this little mic battle. But what's more is that I didn't even recognize it. And that's why I wanted to start with it. When we finally pushed the record button, Callie pointed out the instructive irony that I started an interview on disability with a disabling experience. Once you use those words, I just saw the whole thing differently. Disability is a category that just it impacts so many people's lives. And it's something that that really touches all of us. But because of our kind of normative expectations of what it means to be able bodied, yeah. fit, self-sufficient, independent, able to do and do things on time and get where we need to be and quickly and efficiently, that it's also a category that sometimes inspires feelings of fear or anxiety. One kind of pushes it out of mind because I often want to maintain this image of a self-sufficient, able-bodied person, able to navigate the world yeah. and do all the things that my life demands of me. In this episode of For the Life of the World, Callie McCauley and I discuss the theological and moral dimensions of disability through three stories of her care and service with the physically and intellectually disabled, one about VA hospital patients undergoing amputation and the loss of a leg, one about autism and the reframing of experience, and one about a power shift, a surgeon's development of multiple sclerosis and how to deal with the anger and loss of agency and autonomy, feelings of shame. As set up for these stories, Callie introduces three distinct models for thinking about disability, the minority model, the social model, in the political model. 
And we talk about the suffering of chronic pain, the insensitivity of patronizing temptations to minimize and marginalize and just keep disability out of view, maintaining a sense of hope and possibility amidst loss, the role that spirituality plays in a person integrating a disabling experience, the biblical and theological stories that create or critique our narratives of disability, and finally, an examination of the conditions of possibility, a phrase I love, not just for flourishing, but for making life work at all. Thanks for listening today, friends. When I encounter my world, it's on the assumption, it's usually on on some kind of ground level assumption, that I'm going to be able to do whatever it is that I want to do. I'm glad we started here at a sort of felt raw experiential place because I think the disorienting nature of it, you know, of faltering and spinning or hitting a wall, that one didn't work or, you know, all the doors are locked. It was disorienting. It was perplexing. Guide me through some of the other experiences and what language do you like to bring experience of disability or disabling experiences? Because disability is all about materiality. It's about our bodies and our minds, how they're interacting with the material space, the kinds of obstacles that get in the way and the creative negotiations that folks come up with when they're faced with, with such struggles. How do you understand disability? Let's just lay the definitions out there. So one way we can think about disability is in terms of impairments, physical impairments, mental impairments, social, emotional impairments, and these variety, wide ranging, never, never the same impairments create inhibitions or limits or struggle with the way that society is arranged and set up. Another way to think about it is that disability actually emerges from how society has been thought. We have arranged the world in such a way that ramps and elevators, for example, are not necessarily present for all folks to access physical space. So society has ideas about what the average body is like and can do. Mm -hmm. And then those ideas get, get incorporated into the way that society is arranged politically and also how material structures get physically constructed. Yeah. So I'm hearing internal and external in at least one way of reading it is Mm -hmm. there's impairments that might be internal or at least endemic in some way, contextually within the life of the individual. But then there's external forces, societal forces for community all sorts of, or just other individuals, perhaps. Yeah, there's the physical reality of our bodies and there is the internal perception of how folks are perceiving what it means to to be a human in the world. Yeah. And there's another way okay. one can think about disability. Yeah. And this one really emerges in the mid 20th century with disability a- activism that in some versions of the story culminates in, in, in America, at least in the 1990s, hmm. um, ADA. But this story is that folks with these non-normative bodies and minds came together, they gathered and organized collectively to create a category of disability that would then empower them in the public sphere. So tell me a little bit about, are there good like terms for each of these three approaches? How would you describe them? Yeah, so the first one is sometimes referred to as the minority model of disability, that okay. there are minority bodies and minds. They they diverge from the nor- from a kind of normative conception of uh, what it means to be an able-bodied human. The second one is sometimes referred to as the social model of disability. Yep. It's not that there's something wrong with individual physical individual humans what's wrong or what's different is the way that society has perceived yeah. those folks and the third way is the third is sometimes called a political model of disability yep. that emerges out of a collective action the way that the disabled themselves have mm-hmm. organized and formed a collective identity okay so then with these three in hand 
how do our starting points with respect to understanding disability lead to different approaches for care, different approaches for advocacy, and a different approach to understanding the experience itself? And are you going to draw from different one? Is it a sort of melange or yeah? where do you stand? So this is something my students especially struggle with this because, okay. because we all want an answer. What's the right way to think about disability? What's the best way? What will do the most justice? The trouble is that all of these various modes of thinking and living a disabled life, they all need to be on the table and they all come together because the reality is there are folks are dealing with physical impairments. They're dealing with chronic pain and the real suffering that emerges out of experiences of disability. Yeah. And so the first the first model or the first way of thinking disability as a minority body or a body life, that becomes really crucial for the way that it can really recognize the suffering. But the second model is important too, because it forces us to look at the arrangement of society, the, the yeah. conditions of possibility that empower our lives or that create obstacles to our flourishing. Mm -hmm. And then the third model is important because here we're centering the disabled mm -hmm. experience and the ways that folks with disabilities have come together despite all of the odds right. that seem to be against their living and flourishing. And they have come together and they've made community and they've created a collective action that has really transformed and changed the very structure of our society. As I hear you describe the, this third political model, I'm sort of hearing in it a kind of analog, maybe to a kind of liberationist approach, where there's a sort of like, you can go through a minority understanding, even a, a social understanding of disability, and yet still marginalize and keep folks out of view at times, continue to ignore or really fail on the approach to care. But there's something morally substantive in this third option where there's a kind of preferential option of some kind for those who are disabled. And so I'm wondering if you can O provide some kind of filter or overlay for how to think morally about each of these different approaches to definitions. Yeah, I think you're right. The worry is that a purely scholarly take that focuses on either just the minority, the kind of minority model or the social model can become patronizing. Yeah. And, and so really centering the stories of those that identify as disabled mm. or and or those that face disabling experiences on a daily basis, that really centering those stories and narratives becomes crucial for doing the work of disability justice. Yeah, I, I need to confess, I often don't feel like I understand the terminology or the language that the disabled community wants to use or is, or finds most empowering. And so I wonder if you could give 101 on how to orient oneself to learning how to speak about disability yeah. better. Evan, you're not alone. Yeah. <laughs> Scholars are always debating about the best language to use, whether it's disability or a kind of there's been a reaffirmation of the language of CRIP as particularly empowering disabled identities. Interesting. There is, yeah, there's just a wide variety of the debates about which model is best to use for thinking disability and the language Every book about disability you read is going to give an argument for different sorts of language and norms around how to talk about disability. And so the reality is that folks within the disability community and within disability studies more broadly are are asking these very same questions about what language to use. And it will it has been fluid. It will continue to change as we as we talk and engage and explore what it means to do disability justice. So we've defined a few different categories or approaches, we might say, to understanding disability. When it comes to understanding an approach to care, advocacy, solidarity, inclusion, how does that, how do we begin to think about that? And because I imagine that there's going to be, there's already some 
yeah, there's some valence already built into the way you described the minority social political views. There's moral valence that seems that's already there. How do you lay the groundwork for understanding an ethic of disability? Do you just want to tell stories? I think we should tell stories. Maybe that's itself instructive, right? That that there is a kind of bottom up experience that you have to appreciate and understand that might be inherent to an ethics of disability. Yeah. Yeah. So my approach is is really rooted in stories in narratives of the body, in narratives of interactions and experiences of disability. It's also rooted in the stories that have been told about disability, stories that are biblical in nature, the healing, the healing narratives of the gospels and, but also theological stories. Right. So in Augustine, City of God, for example, Augustine is going to talk about healing as a witness to divine activity, which may, on the one hand, suggest that what happens when one really believes or has faith is that disability is miraculously gone. And suggests that disability is actually something that is morally wrong, that has to do with a moral impurity or something that is morally wrong with the person. Yeah. This is a kind of narrative that stretches throughout Christian history that that folks with disabilities have have been hurt by, yeah. especially when folks, you know, lay hands, lay hands on the person in the wheelchair and pray that that God will somehow miraculously take disability away. Yeah, like I'm putting using air quotes, fix them. Yes. Yeah, exactly. As though to be disabled is necessarily to be broken in need of healing. But Augustine, in the city of God, Hmm. in the very same book, I believe it's book 22, he talks about wounds and scars of martyrs that actually remain on their bodies in heaven, such that it becomes a feature, an identifying feature of of who they are and what they have done in this life. It's a mark that is then glorified and amplified in the resurrected body. That's Thomas and resurrected Jesus, right? Exactly. Explore the wounds in the resurrected body. Yeah. So there are there are these stories that are scattered, ubiquitous in Christian history and thought that also say the disabled body is a sign of divine activity, a sign of God's wondrous involvement with the created world, that God cares about our pain and our suffering, that God is present with us in that suffering. And then... Are you ready for this next step? Yes. And it's these stories for Christians that really make a difference when they when they face a disability or experience of disability. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you a story. Please. This summer, I spent working in the chaplaincy office at a VA hospital in Connecticut. And I, I was assigned the surgical intensive care unit. And so spent a lot of time with folks preparing to receive receiving and then experiencing the aftermath of amputation. Amputation. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So Christians, many of the Christians that I worked with and they were, and they, in this case, they were all Christians. They went in to surgery thinking about loss, loss of employment, loss of fun hobbies that maybe it was hiking with a friend. Right. Or, or going for a bike ride. And these are, so these are patients that you're describing, like they're, you're walking through the process with them as they're. Exactly. Anticipating. Yeah. What it's going to be like. We're talking and praying. Wow. We're reading scripture together. And it always starts with thinking about the loss. Yeah. But then yeah. as there's prayer and scripture, and this often comes from the patient themselves a feeling of divine presence in that, in the process, in the experience of loss. And in each case, what seems to emerge, the loss doesn't go away. Sure. Yeah. There are feelings of loss and that, that continue. That's going to be a simultaneous kind of thing, right? Yeah. Please continue though. But then there's possibility and hope. So I worked with one man, a Baptist, a lover of prayer and and song. And 
But he started thinking about what amputation would open up for spending more time with the grandkids because he wouldn't be working, what it might mean for longer phone conversations with friends in California, that all of a sudden that there is a sense that the loss coexists with possibility and renewal and Christian stories of divine presence and divine activity and a kind of being being with us in our pain and our suffering in experiences of disability, that that becomes that religion and faith becomes a, a, a sustain has a sustaining function in one's life and carries one's through and then opens. And I want to say that the Holy Spirit is totally involved here, but opens then one up to 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 new possibilities, creative possibilities for engaging with one another in our communities and what can happen Mm -hmm. when we, yeah, approach disability through different narrative frameworks. Can I ask what was amputated? I want to know more about the personal story and we can keep his identity (laughs) safe, but I would love to know like some of the details to enter into some of what it was like. Yeah. So I'm thinking of two men in particular that I worked with over the summer. One experienced an, an amputation of almost almost the full left leg. Wow. And the other experienced an amputation of the bottom half of the left leg bef- below the knee. And there was a lot of struggle when the patient discovered that the amputation would need to go further above the knee. Struggle because of the the limitations that might bring with respect to movement and yep. navigating that this particular patient had become accustomed to. So you talk about the role that spirituality plays in understanding. I think what I'm hearing is the whole of the experience, not play spirituality just as a response to understanding possibility, but a, very much understanding the loss itself yeah, and integrating them. So I'm wondering how you would describe the process of the word integration comes to mind because of the both physical and mental aspects of enduring a disabling experience like this, where you go from at least, you know, you go from able to disabled. That must feel disintegrating in so many ways to the individual. And I can only imagine that we might set up a, you know, like societally with respect to both advocacy and healing and care, we would want to help them find reintegration of some kind just personally. Mm -hmm. But how do you think about religion's role in, in this process? Yeah, I think you're really onto something. The kind of the stories that we tell about life become a kind of fodder for our own formation, self-formation, and how we then go on to perceive who it is and what our meaning and purpose is in the world. And so going through a disabling experience, moving from what what especially from the outside often looks like a kind of self-sufficient, normal, yeah. I'm using air quotes yep. here, normal body and life, and then moving into especially a kind of existence that is perceived both internally as yeah. a disabled existence and also from society as, and now you are marked disabled because of the, yeah, physical amputation that is visible to everyone around you, that there is a, yeah, a disintegration of the kind of, the kind of self that one self and story that one had constructed. And, And yeah, I think religion, religion is a, it's both, it is a tool to help in the reconstruction, the gathering together of the various pieces of who and what I thought I was, but now I'm some in something different. It's also those very experiences can also serve to critique the narratives that have emerged out of religion about what it means to be, for example, whole or yeah. or what it means to live a graced and flourishing life. Yeah. And I think, well, here's a what I take to be a common, a common take is that the proliferation of miracles 
in the gospel narratives, for instance, where the quote lame or sick or just ill of many different type varieties are healed. That's a kind of norming experience for some people, or at least is pur- purported to be, is that, well, this says disability just is meant to be healed. And unless it's healed, there's no wholeness. And I think we want to challenge that. But it's tough when you're operating from a scriptural model that at least seems to be r- commonly read that way. How do you read the body of miracle stories in the scriptures? I'll stop the question there. <laughs> yeah, this is <laughs> exactly, this is a question that so many of my students come to class with on the first day okay. is this brokenness, wholeness motif in Christianity, the damage it has done, especially for folks with disabilities that that cannot be cured, for whom disability becomes an integral part of their identity. They may even have experiences of pride or affirmation associated with living a disability, with living a disabled life, with being in disabled community. And so what to do with these, yeah, the narratives of of healing and cure that are scattered, especially throughout the Gospels. For me, I think it's important to emphasize first the metaphorical nature of the story, that they oftentimes the that disability is being used in a literary sense yeah. to draw attention to the site of divine activity. And in the metaphor, what's being talked about is a transformation from sometimes doubt to faith, sometimes a kind of a state of sin to a state of acceptance. Mm -hmm. And the function of the disabled body in those narratives, sometimes disability is associated with sin, but other times in the narratives, the the disabled person is the one that is elevated as having a kind of superior faith. Yeah. The the one that's coming to mind is the pool of Siloam where your faith has made you well. And it's just like this incessant calling after Jesus, son of David. In this scenario, I'm, if I'm remembering rightly, there's just no one there to place the man into the waters when they get stirred. Mm -hmm. I don't, I confess, I don't know what that means. That's right. There are folks that are like clambering over him because yeah. he's lame and he just, he and can't get there fast the enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I imagine bespeaks at least one kind of context that we're, I think that we do still have with us today, which is a clamoring or a kind of urgency and anxiety to move toward healing and to move toward the elimination of disability. And, uh, and yet he just keeps getting passed up. Yeah. So here the story is one of slowness, of constancy, of a kind of unwavering faith despite intense pain and suffering. Okay, so you're describing this as a sort of calling attention to the sight of divine attention. Please rephrase this because I liked the way you put yeah. that, but I, I'm missing it. That disability, because it is societally shocking, yeah, calls attention to the site of divine activity. Yes. And those narratives, I think, yes, I think Christians ought to critique the attachment between the or and critique metaphors of disability that attach disability to sin in particular. And we should rethink, of course, what it means to be whole and rethink what the scriptures are really telling us about wholeness and the appearance of faith, what sort of bodies have access to the work that Christ is doing in the world. And Disability Studies has all sorts of resources and disabled experiences and stories have all sorts of resources for returning to those passages and looking at them and looking at them differently. Can we talk about intellectual disabilities? Yeah. That's a different kind of disabling experience for a person. And so do you have any stories that you would, might want to get started on there? I do. Please. Yeah. So here, so here's a story from my own experience. Every Christmas, 
I return to my hometown where my parents still live. Which is? Nina, Wisconsin. Cool. It's just south of Green Bay, about an hour and a half north of Milwaukee. For those that know Wisconsin geography. Do you have a hat that looks like a block of cheese? Of course. <laughs> Requirement. <laughs> Continue. Nina, Wisconsin. Yes. You're going back I for Christmas. I grew up in Wisconsin. I go back for Christmas every year and hopefully a few other times as well. And yeah. I always, I'm one of the kind of crowning moments of going back to visit my parents is, is getting to worship Christmas, Christmas Eve with my mom. So we, so we, yeah, head into worship, sit beside one another. Mm. And I need to confess a little bit about my own, in my own engagement with worship. <laughs> Okay. As a scholar of Christianity yes. and Christian thought, I tend to spend most of my time in worship, critiquing the sermon, critiquing the liturgy. My hands up. <laughs> in the most generous way possible, but in my head, that's how I stay. I stay engaged in sure. worship. Sure. There are a few other things I like to do, which, which kind of push against some of Good. the... I know that lots of listeners are just waiting with bated <laughs> breath on this one. Yeah. I think you're talking to the right crowd. <laughs> Push against some of the, the normative practices of Christian worship or the sorts of things that have been said about Christian worship. So one of my one of the things that I do, which is noticeable only to myself, <laughs> is that I on occasion sing harmony. Sure. which I see is pushing back against a very <laughs> famous Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yes. Central, the central in he my and I parted elite ways <laughs> Once I discovered his aversion to harmony. What the yeah. heck? So pushing back against church authority is something that is a key part of my worship experience. That's a healthy thing. I do this to my mother as well, which she doesn't like. I sing very loudly. Most of the time on key, which she both finds <laughs> endearing and embarrassing somehow simultaneously. So while I'm doing this and playing my own kind of worship, Christian worship game. Yes. There is an autistic woman named Oksana. She's seated on the other side of the worship space. And, oh, I need to take a step sure. back. Do you know, do you know the symbol stern? I don't think so. It's an organ stop. That's shaped like a star. And it... Uh, You're going to have to back up further, though, because I don't think anyone's going to know what the organ stop is. <laughs> and or it's, a, it's an attachment to the organ. Okay. That is played to mark, like, really important points in, in a hymn. Yeah. Um, so perhaps a kind of alleluia, it might mark that. And historically, they are not in tune. It clamors. It's loud. It's a, so it's star shaped and it has a bunch of bells. And I found one online. Here's what a cymbal stern sounds like. I hate them. Because. Tell us what you really think. Because they right, disrupt my ability to stay on key. They like interrupt my worship and practice. Yeah. They like they make a loud noise and then I can't get back into the hymn that I was singing and irritating my mother who is sitting right beside me. And so I am having these feelings of irritation and annoyance and oh, why did the Germans have to create that in the 16th or 17th century or whenever it was. But Oksana, the autistic woman seated on the other side of the worship space, she starts laughing and clapping in response to this like loud obnoxious clamor mm. and all of a sudden my attention is drawn to her and it shifts my relationship with the zimbelstern with the disruption of worship and all of a sudden i see the kind of joy and pleasure that it's creating creating for her yeah. and seeing that joy all of a sudden like i'm like transformed in the moment and i have this whole new relationship yeah. with the material space the sounds that i'm engaging yeah and yeah it feels like i don't know church people sometimes talk about this as a god moment sure. or something yeah. but yeah it feels like grace or something this but radical also just turn a, a kind of a kind of noticing centering oxana's experience so you center that experience and allow it to completely reset the norm there's a mode of reception and appreciation that you might not otherwise have been able to tap into yeah and i think for me what's what's really important is that 
From a second person perspective, I have no idea really what's going on in Oksana's world, yeah. how she's, sure. I can observe that there is some joy and pleasure, but I don't know how she's interacting with what's being communicated in worship yeah. other than it appears to be creating intense feelings of joy. And, and so for me, I don't want to project my own kind of theological interpretation on sure. her experience. But at the same time, I think that that interaction becomes then a lens through which we can rethink the role of sensation and yeah. and human interaction, even at a distance in worship and what that might mean for how it is the Holy Spirit is in, act, in interacting with us, even in, or interact, I hope, interacting with me, even in my feelings of irritation, annoyance, critique of the Christian tradition more broadly, as I engage on all those various levels, how the Holy Spirit is working through sensation to transform my own experience, even at the level of just pure affect and emotion. The word otherness or or really strangeness and i don't mean that in any particularly loaded way difference that's an avenue i want to make sure we get to which is that feeling of disorientation or a feeling of you know something being abnormal or strange alien other it's a kind of you know you might say xenophobia really a fear of the other that would lead to an anxious approach to simply wanting to either marginalize, hide, clean up. I'm trying to describe a more vicious approach of healing, which is healing to almost eliminate what really we don't need to receive as, as wrong in the first place or yeah. as broken in the first place. The stigma that follows disability of all kinds, but particularly intellectual disabilities, it leads to a kind of fear. Yeah, I think you're totally onto something because it is, and this is connected to what we were talking about earlier with respect to the stories society tells about what it is to be normal, to be productive, a contributing member of society yeah. are really bound to ideas of intellectual capacity, physical capacity, and in the Christian tradition, especially a capacity to serve and care for others when that seems to be removed or the notion that in one's life, those possibilities could be stripped away from who I am. That's terrifying. The stories that we tell about, about normalcy and disability are bound to how we think of ourselves as humans and what it means to flourish. And those same stories invite fear when we even subconsciously or implicitly consider that the loss of memory or a loss of intellectual capacity could be a real lived possibility for one's own life. I don't know how this particular phrase lands. It's not my own. I heard it once, but I've I've reflected on it before that there's really just two kinds of people, those who are disabled and those who will be disabled. How do you react to that phrase? Is it too simplistic? It's a truism that I think is often true. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think what's really true about that is the way that disability impacts everyone's life. And there are visible disabilities. There are also invisible disabilities. Folks that live with chronic pain, those that experience depression and anxiety, which is now being in included in the kind of category of disability. Those also that have experiences of cancer and other illnesses that are now being incorporated into what disability studies scholars think of as disability more broadly. What I find interesting about that is the sense in which it tells us something about our own humanity and about what it means to flourish as a human. Mm -hmm. And uh, so here's another one that like, I'm just going to make the claim. I don't stand by this claim, but how do you respond to this? Because I think it's embedded in a lot of our, what you might think of as knee jerk responses to disability in American life is that disabled lives are not worth living. How do you respond to that? Yeah, 
I think that that sentiment is really in at the heart of the kind of idea of what it means to live the dream of the American life which is a life that is rooted in ideas of self-sufficiency, of independence, of a capacity to engage in work and particularly fulfilling or meaningful work. It's rooted in ideas of autonomy, but also ideas mm-hmm. of contribution and service and being able to give back to the society yeah. at large. And disability really counteracts, and in disability studies, we might say, has counter stories for for what it means to live a flourishing life. What are the values that actually make a difference? Can I tell you another story? Please. Yes. <laughs> so this is another story that comes out of my chaplaincy experience at the VA hospital mm-hmm. working in a surgical intensive care unit. I was working with a patient that was in the late stages of MS. And so, um, could you just describe multiple sclerosis? Yeah. So I'm going to describe, I think just the, the physical situation that this particular patient was in. He was totally dependent on others for care. This included, he had a colostomy bag, so couldn't go to the bathroom on his own, needing to be washed and bathed by others, constant feelings or insecurities around how he was smelling because of that real physical reality. He, He couldn't eat without assistance from a caregiver. And what was so striking about this particular patient is that he had a long career as a surgeon. Oh, wow. And so now the roles are reversed where the surgeon whose meaning and purpose was to care and heal others is now faced with the situation where he's the one needing to receive care who's in pain and who will not experience healing. Wow. And so when I first met this patient, he was angry. Sure. He was suffering, struggling because he felt like his life was now worthless. He said, you know, my whole meaning and purpose was was to care for others. And now I can't use the bathroom without significant help from other people. Yeah, I need to ask someone else to cut up my food. And his own experience of that real, real just utter dependence on the other folks in his surroundings, the dependence, the no longer being able to care and work and serve others really made him feel like his life was no longer worth living. It's interesting to think about that through the lens of power, Mm -hmm. right? Or autonomy, governing oneself. But in the case of a surgeon being charged with the care and governance of others, And then to have that flipped around is a truly, there's different layers to that. Mm -hmm. And so because it, because of the extremity in this case, right, going from being an extremely skilled physician who can enact healing in others to then not just, not just losing that capacity slowly, but then actually having to become a person who is radically dependent on the other the shift of power in that man's life Mm -hmm. must have felt just extreme. That's right. Yeah. All of the power and material gain that comes from being a surgeon and then to be what, what feels like for him, a kind of imprisonment in a hospital room, unable to even shift one's body in bed. Yeah. It's, it's a radical shift in life experience. How do we support individuals in retaining a sense of agency through the process? Mm-hmm. The experience of agency is one of, one of these things that you can't necessarily count on that always being there. Yeah. Agency comes and goes. And the question of dependency and I should say interdependency on others and just the concept of needing people to help us or do things for us. It's just, that's a reality of life. How do we manage that and try to 
provide some kind of perspective that could suggest that life is indeed worth living yeah in light of the, in light of living with disability so i'll talk so first i want to talk about what happened with this particular patient yeah, please, and, yeah, and the transformation that, that he underwent and then i want to okay, speak good. about it in more general terms okay, so for this patient there was a constellation of symbols that he used to construct what it means to live a meaningful, fulfilling life. And those included things like autonomy and autonomy, being able to provide and give care, being independent and self-sufficient. So what happened in our conversations as I, I would meet with him two or three times a week over the course of the summer, what happened is that kind of constellation of symbols fell apart. And together, we started to rework a new set of symbols that then could guide his own thinking about what it means to live an existence not worthless, but actually has glimmers of hope and life and worth, even in a completely dependent state. So we talked about a relationship and we got to practice like developing with one another a relationship. Yeah. I remember, you know, I was able to this, he loved this. I was able to bring him some writing. I was working on an article at the time and he could uh, push back on some of my thoughts and sure. I would, and, but also be a kind of collaborator, yeah. a kind of intellectual collaborator in his best moments for thinking about disability and, and experiences of disability. And then that being able to find alternative modes of interacting and engaging and and also giving. What's um, interesting about these symbols, forgive me, is this the way that they construe the self, right? They're symbols for the self. And it's interesting how at least that aspect of a life worth living does have to do with how you regard yourself. Yeah. And how you come to accept the most trying circumstances that end up coming your way. Exactly. Yeah. So here it was about a kind of a shift from autonomy, independence, caregiving to a kind of model of the self based in relationship, in receiving care and also giving it back in these new ways that were not the technical ways of a surgeon, but were the ways of a kind of a conversation, a deepening of thought and life together. And that became a new framework for thinking for him what was possible. And think more generally with my students when we're thinking about alternative ways to think about care and disability together and what it means to live a flourishing and fulfilling life. We start with the kind of bare conditions of possibility. And sometimes it's helpful to think at the kind of minute level of one's own day. What are the conditions of possibility <laughs> for your day to go well? What are all of the yeah. things like, um, do you pick up clothes from the dry cleaner? Does someone wash your clothes? Are you engaging with your, with your kiddos at home? Who, what are all the people and the material circumstances that are necessary for you to go about your day and do all of the things that you need to yeah. or want to get done? Sure. And then we'll take a particular experience. Okay. Now, what if your life is one marked by chronic pain? What are the conditions of possibility then for you to experience those same relationships? What do you need? What do you need from the folks in your midst, in your, in your kind of immediate circle? What's the, what's the work that they need to do so that you can continue to produce podcasts or, or have, have interesting conversations with your friends. What are all the various material and financial facets of making that possible for you? Yeah. And then how do we think about that on a local level with respect to the policies that cities need to put in place for, for citizens to, to have those creative and meaningful possibilities for their life? Conditions of possibility is a really generative way of framing things. You can see both how it, it can assist someone who might encounter various forms of disabling experiences. You can see how it helps 
frame and contextualize that life for someone who is otherwise quite able. What I'm hearing in your point about the conditions of possibility for making life work for all of us is that we're not nearly as autonomous as we thought we were. We're not nearly as individual or independent or powerful as we might tell ourselves. I mean, what I'm picking up on is the process of trying to appreciate how the conditions of possibility are often set by for forces outside of us, hmm. other people, let alone, you know, the, comp the condition of possibility of life being set by God and held together by God in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I love that you brought God into the conversation because I think religion and religious life can actually be an empowering tool first for that. It helps us to recognize our various dependencies on others and particular material circumstances for life to happen. But it can also be empowering for folks that start to notice when those things aren't working. Yeah. And that then that can be an empowering tool to motivate us to perhaps make some changes, shift policies or, yeah, build that ramp that the church still hasn't found fun to, <laughs> to put in place. To what I hear there is to now pay attention to those conditions of possibility and interact with them in more creative ways. And think about it there, you know, think about these conditions which seem so familiar, seem so normal. In some cases, they seem like if they changed, then life wouldn't be doable. None of us can set up those conditions on our own. Thank you so much, Callie. You're welcome. production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured Callie McCauley. Production assistance by Logan Ledman, Macy Bridge, and Kaylin Yun. And I'm Evan Rosa. I edit and produce the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu, where you can find past episodes, articles, books, and other educational resources that help people envision and pursue lives worthy of our humanity. And if you're new to the show, remember to hit subscribe in your favorite pod catcher so you don't miss an episode. To our loyal supporters, though, and faithful listeners, we have a humble request. If you enjoyed this episode, would you mind telling a friend? And if you have the time, give us an honest rating in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And either way, thanks for listening, friends. <laughs> <laughs>